This is the first of a two-part series in which I will introduce you to the theory of sociocultural materialism, a macro-social theory of the origin, maintenance, and change of human societies. This theory is a sociological revision of Marvin Harris's theory of cultural materialism. Harris was an anthropologist and his theory was strongly influenced by Robert Malthus and Karl Marx, as well as evolutionary theory in the social sciences and biology. To Harris's underlying framework, I have added the insights of Max Weber on bureaucracy and rationalization, as well as the insights of many contemporary sociologists and anthropologists. In this lecture, we will focus on the universal structure of all human societies. In the next, we will look at the dynamics of sociocultural systems, how and why they change through time, as well as identify the overall direction of evolutionary change in the world system of societies. All life begins with the environment and must live within the constraints of that environment. Environmental constraints consist of depletion of, of needed resources and pollution. Environments have limited amounts of resources. Human societies must adapt to environmental conditions in order to survive. Resources needed by human life include breathable air, potable water, shelter from the elements. Other human needs include the need to eat, and people will generally opt for diets that offer more rather than fewer calories and proteins and other nutrients. People cannot be totally inactive but when confronted with a given task, they prefer to carry it out by expending less rather than more human energy. People are also highly sexed and generally find reinforcing pleasure from sexual intercourse. And finally, people need love and affection in order to feel secure and happy. And other things being equal, they will act to increase the love and affection that others give them. It is through the exploitation of the environment, physical, social, that these human needs are met. Modern industrial peoples are just as dependent upon their environments as are hunters and gatherers. In order to survive and to meet basic human needs, humans have banded together in antagonistic cooperation to form sociocultural systems, a fancy name for societies. To understand these systems, it is necessary to break them down into their component parts. This makes it possible to examine the relationships among the components to see how they affect one another and how each affects the whole. A society's infrastructure is its most basic component. Without it, the physical survival of the society is impossible. All societies must effectively exploit the natural environment to survive. The production component consists of the technology and social practices by which a society manipulates its environment by modifying the amount and type of resources needed. Production technology consists of the tools and techniques with which humans adapt to their physical environment. It varies from hunting and gathering tools, through digging sticks, plows, to modern technologies and occupational specialties that we have today. Population factors are those involving the nature and dynamics of human populations the size and density of the population, its growth, decline, or stability, its age and sex composition are all important in determining the amount and type of resources needed from the environment. Demographic factors also include techniques of population regulation or birth control, mating patterns, sexual behavior, abortion, and infanticide. The 
second component of sociocultural systems is that of the social structure. The structure consists of the organized patterns, the human groups and organizations of social life. Again, the structure can be broken down into two parts. Primary groups consist of small groups that order our lives within domestic settings. Primary groups are normally small and intimate and we play multiple roles within them. Examples include the family, both nuclear and extended families, community, voluntary groups, friendship networks, and some religious groups. Secondary organizations regulate production, production, exchange, and consumption within and between groups and other sociocultural systems. Examples include government at various levels, military, police, corporations, education, media services, and welfare organizations. The primary and secondary group dichotomy encompasses all human groups responsible for the allocation and distribution of goods and services within the population of a society to satisfy human needs and desires. Hierarchies based on class, sex, race, caste, age, ethnic, and other statuses exist throughout the structure of societies. In American society, elite status is very much dependent upon class, race, and age. Sociocultural systems are not organized around the allocation of the greatest good for the greatest number of people. The existence of elites within the structure very much affects the distribution of resources to meet human needs and desires. While human needs are universal, the ways in which societies meet these needs, as well as the extent to which these needs are met, are highly variable. In the study of any society, it is critical to note who the elite are, what is their material interest, and to gauge the amount of power that the elite have at their disposal. Whereas the structure refers to actual behavior, the superstructure refers to ideas, ideologies, as well as the motivators for human action. The behavioral superstructure includes beliefs such as shared assumptions of what is true and false, values, socially defined conceptions of worth, norms, shared standards of rules regarding conduct, as well as the knowledge base of a society. Examples include religious ideology, the processes and products of science, art, ritual, sports, as well as empirical knowledge gained from experience. The mental superstructure is lifted straight out of Weber and consists of four basic motivators of human action. Weber said there were four basic motivators of human behavior. The first, rational action in relation to a value. Examples include attending college because you value the life of the mind, doing the right thing out of religious or philosophical ideas of right and wrong. The second, traditional action, is action dictated by custom or habit. Examples include the sign of the cross, facing the front of an elevator, not talking at movies, attending college because your mother attended. The third, emotional action, is determined by affective or emotional states. Examples include attending college for a good time or because your significant other attends that college. And finally, we have formal rationality or goal-oriented rational action. Examples include building a raft across a river, studying to get a good grade, attending college to get a good job. Now, most action consists of a combination of these four basic motivators. 
But Weber, Weber noticed a curious phenomenon. Over the course of social evolution, more and more of our behavior is guided by rational action in relation to a goal, and less and less our behavior is motivated by custom, values, or emotions. He calls this the rationalization process. We will examine this rationalization process more fully in the next lecture on the dynamics of sociocultural systems. So these are the three basic components of sociocultural systems. The materialist approach places the infrastructure as the foundation of that system. In the next lecture, we will begin with this diagram of the structure and dynamics of sociocultural systems and explore how the various components of the system relate to one another and to the environment. As can be seen in the diagram, we place the infrastructure squarely on the environment as it is the principal interface between a sociocultural system and the natural environment. The infrastructure, again, contains the principal means by which a society exploits its environment, regulates the amount and type of energy and raw materials necessary for its survival and growth. Human groups and organizations form the social structures of society, and their number, size, power, and complexity are very much dependent upon the characteristics of the infrastructure. Recall, too, that human groups are hierarchical in nature and that the power and interest of elites largely determine the allocation of resources among the population. The final characteristic of the universal structure, the superstructure, encompasses the ideational components of the system. These ideational components originate in the concrete behavior patterns systematically engaged in by members of a society. That is, the structure, and this structure is largely based upon infrastructural conditions whereby people solve the basic problems of human existence. In the next lecture, we will explore the dynamics of sociocultural systems, beginning with the causal arrow on the right of the diagram, and then moving on to the feedback loops represented on the left. I appreciate your time and attention. Goodbye for now. For a free download of my new book, Sociocultural Systems, Principles of Structure and Change, go to Athabasca University Press. Uh, better yet, buy a hard copy of the book uh, uh, from there or most online bookstores. Further reading on ecological evolutionary theory, uh, you can't go wrong with Carnero, Robert Carnero, uh, anything by Mark, and anything by Gerhard Lenski. I strongly recommend ecological evolutionary theory, principles and applications, uh, tremendous book.